All right, hey everybody, I have a guest today. I don't have uh, many guests, but uh, I'm actually pretty excited for this guy. He, uh, I don't know him very well, but we are in, um, we have actually well, uh, uh, roofed, we have we have lived in the same place together for, for a couple of days. In Cabo, yeah. Cabo, that's right, that's right. And uh, I mean, without further ado, this, this is Jacob Stoller. I don't actually even know much about what you do. You're kind of an enigma, you know, like uh, <laughs> you you, uh, you have great, you know, obviously we're sort of connected on the internet mostly. And, you know, you always have great, interesting, sort of thoughtful things to say. I know from other people that you have had a, a, a very successful business career. I know from Cabo, you have a great, you know, relationship with your wife and, uh, but I don't know that much about you specifically. So I'm kind of excited to learn more about you and talk some shop at the same time. Yeah. I'm actually really bad about, uh, talking about myself. Um, in fact, I get asked to come on podcasts a lot and occasionally I get asked for a bio and like, I refuse to write one. Um, and it got me canceled one time because he was like i'm like you're you're telling me to come on your podcast which means there's some value you think that i bring to the table why don't you just lead with that and he's like well you know we can't do anything if we don't have a bio i'm like i'm not narcissistic enough to write this thing about me about what i've done and who i am like it's not you know what i'm saying yeah and uh like i said they were like well we're just not going to do it then i was like okay (laughs) um i think there was another one where i was booking time and asked for a bio thing and it was required. I sent the the first verse of the song Loser by Beck <laughs> nice. um, as my bio. And um, I don't know, I just don't, I get into situations and I don't, 10 years, 20 years ago, I would have loved to talk about me. Yeah. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to say, but I was certainly very interested in myself. Yeah. And uh, now that I have stuff to talk about, I don't, I just don't care to do it. Um, I don't get anything out of that. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't, you know, I do what I do all day long. And then people want to ask me to talk about it. And it's like, uh, can we talk about video game? Like anything else? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I get it. Um, it, it no, but I mean, I, 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 was gonna I say, spent, I go, go ahead. I was going to say, I didn't need a, I don't need a bio from you. What I, yeah. I did try to do some recon. Yeah. Uh, Cause you've been on podcasts before. So I listened to, a, you know, a couple of them. I got a little oh, cool. bit of background, but yeah, you're an interesting guy for sure. And I'm excited to, to, you know, dive in learn more about you. 100%. Yeah. I have a, an interesting background. Um, I kind of just did whatever I wanted when I wanted to do it when I was younger and it got me to a lot of arguments. Um, especially with like my grandma. Yeah. Um, I had a big blowout one, I think it was Thanksgiving what college are you going to go to? I was like, I'm not doing that. And she went off the handle and she worked at a college. Like she worked at Iowa state university. Yep. And so like hearing that I was not interested in college was, did not go over well. I was 15 or 16 at the time, I think. Yep. And uh, that got ugly real fast. Have you, um, have you always been like a business guy? I know from like listening to the podcast that you've done a bunch of different things. Like, you know, MMA, MMA, like announcer or promoter yeah. or something. Right. I, I heard about that. Um, Both, yeah. I know you're in the sort of the wellness space right now too. Mm-hmm. You've done a bunch of different stuff. Like you, you, can you just, here's the other thing too, just so that for the, for the people that are listening, just a little context, you know, can you sort of just like laundry like recast <laughs> yeah. some of the things that you've done a little bit? Yeah. So, um, I, I got started with the MMA stuff before I was old enough to smoke. Um, I was working in a, a teen nightclub uh, doing like the MC, like DJ stuff. Yeah. And um, it just so happened that a Friday night fight thing started. And obviously because I was part of the nightlife industry, that was something that they were targeting. So it was like, okay, well, like, you know, why don't you do this too? And like, so I have Asperger's. So like public situations are, are hard for me. And with the nightclub stuff, I knew everybody. 
so like it was easy for me to go there on a Saturday night. It was it was a lot of my friends, you know, people that I knew outside of there. Like going to this this fight night thing on the east side of Des Moines with you know a rougher a rougher crowd, if you will. Um, I remember having to get drunk before it, and like, I mean, I was eighteen at the time for that, and uh, it was a it was wild. We had people getting teeth knocked out. Um, I ended up fighting in there once. Um, my dad started teaching me how to box when I was five. Um, so one night I was drunk and I was like, oh yeah, I'll fight next week if somebody wants to, you know? Yeah. And, uh, we got to the end of the night and no one had signed up to fight me yet. So I don't know if you're a big MMA guy, uh, Josh near, um, came out of there. Jeremy Stevens came out of there. Houston okay. Alexander fought there. Kevin Burns fought there. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking ton, tons of guys that were in the UFC and, um, one of Josh Neer's like newer understudies signed up to fight me. And I remember not, I didn't even wrap my hands cause I thought he was going to knock me out. And, uh, so, you know, got in there, cargo shorts, no shirt, yeah, didn't wrap my hands, had boxing gloves on. And, um, I was just pumping a jab out and he rotated right to left. So I faked the jab and loaded everything I had into a right hand and, he was out, out for a pretty long time. Like I broke this knuckle when I hit him. Yeah. Uh, I started taking my glove off because I knew I broke my hand. And uh, the ref started moving me to different corners. And then they wanted to call it a no contest because if he would have got up, I broke my hand and I probably wouldn't have continued. Like, yeah, <laughs> there was some drama. Um, from there, I actually started traveling, doing MMA announcing. Um, I, I was in Canada on TSN, which is basically their their ESPN like okay. channel. Yeah. And uh, I even had trouble getting into Canada because I have a felony for um, what was it? What was it? Uh, conspiracy to commit copyright infringement. So I was part of like a whereas group. And so we used to crack copyrights. Like the guy that ran our group was the one that released windows 95 three months early. Okay. Um, so he got, he got in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> like I didn't, I got in trouble, but it wasn't trouble like that. And, um, is that, is that and, something the feds come after you for? Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, man, I'll never forget it because I did my nightclub stuff on Thursday night. I was drunk. I think I was even on ecstasy and seven 30 in the morning on Friday, there was like 15 FBI agents around our apartment complex. And, uh, they knock on the, like number one, that many people for two, like 18, 20 year old guys. Like, what the fuck am I going to do? Grab my computer and like run into the forest behind our apartment right, complex. Right. Like, what what were we going to do? Um, but anyway, uh, they knocked on the door. My roommate answered it. He came and knocked on my bedroom door and was like, there's people here that want to see us. And uh, I was like, tell, tell them to come back at noon. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I don't think I don't think they're going to come back. Yeah. And so we went through a like a four hour. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't call it a deposition, but. It was, we got interrogated for that long in separate rooms. Yeah. And uh, they took my, my desktop computer, all my burned discs. Um, I mean, they took everything and I went back to bed after it was over. And when I woke up, I thought it was like a dream and uh, it was not. <laughs> so no. um, they well, helped me at the air. Around. No, dude. And, and the thing that kind of sucks about it is because I was more doing it on like the music side. Okay. I wasn't selling anything like we would break the cop. You remember when like so, so deaf did that thing where you could pull the, the music off a CD two or three times. And then that was it. Yeah. Like we would break that. Right. Um, and we would trade MP3 files yeah. with other people, but I never sold it. I never made any money. Like it was a hobby for me. And so, you know, a 20 year old kid having that happen, like, my dad was in wealth management. So like the, my plan for life was to, to do what he did. Well, I can't now because yeah. the SEC is not going to let me. So like my, the entire trajectory of what I planned my life to become it completely stopped um, when they did that. And it took them another six and a half years to like finish it. Yeah. Um, I ended up, I had to testify so I was happy to testify in the case that they asked me to, because the dude that was on trial was the one that got us caught. 
Um, he was the one that ran our server. What's funny is, dude, the server was in Texas, like 15 minutes away from where I live now. And so it's it's kind of like weird how life you comes get, full circle. How did you get like caught? Did they just do like some computer magic or something and just so the server that this guy was being paid to maintain, he was supposed to, it was supposed to be a personal server. So it was, it was supposed to be behind his firewalls, his encryptions, this and that, okay. that. but it was in a big ass server building in Texas. Oh. So the FBI traced the IP to the server, then basically set it up as a honey trap. Yeah. So, you know, everybody that we were dealing with across the globe was logging into this server to either place files or to take files that had been given to them. Yep. And so they had all of us. Um, and the thing is, you can't log into a secure server like that behind a VPN. So they had everybody. Uh, um, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was wild. And um, we had dodged like the, the previous um, thing. And I can't, I always get them confused, but I want to say we were part of operation Buccaneer. And uh, they were going after a, a ripping group that was not us. But because we were the second largest one, because they could get us, they figured they could use us to try and go after those guys. Got it. And so they tried to trap everybody into, I mean, and I was still young. Like when they, I just turned 21, like maybe four days before they raided our house. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, I mean, it was, I didn't know any better. Um the laws that they were trying to use to prosecute us had just been made up. Um, Cause uh, we're talking, this was 2004. Yep. So there were no cyber crime laws yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Um, I remember them coming at me saying that they wanted to charge me $26,000 for every MP3 file I had. And I had close to a terabyte <laughs> of music, which like yeah. if, if you, if you know what we compressed them to, a terabyte that's endless amounts we could have funded the ukraine right. war right. with the money i would have owned many songs yeah i mean it was many and, and 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 what attorney are you going to hire that's going to argue that right there's no case law like what do you base your argument on yeah the they and you'll appreciate this because you understand law they said the jurisdiction for my court case was the northern district of virginia do you know how they designated that? I lived in Iowa, by the way, at the right. time. Right. And the server they had was in a, Texas. They had a Comcast employee right. come and get on the stand and say that one of the files I downloaded passed through a server in the Northern right. District of yep. Texas. Yes. So um, there was one other guy that actually had enough money to hire his own attorney. They ended up getting jurisdiction shot down. Oh. And when they did a local thing, his entire case ended up getting tossed out. Because this was obviously home cooked in yep. DC. Yeah. So like I rode the elevator with the dude that runs the RIAA and he was the one prosecuting me. We were in the same elevator together. Yeah. Um, it was a it was a it was a wild experience. Um, but like that was what created where I am now because I had to figure something new out. Yep. What's weird is I would not have enjoyed wealth management. And I know that now. Um but I still went to work for my dad prior to all of that going down and I fixed all of his marketing. Yeah. You go, um, MMA? did you go MMA to then working for him? Is that sort yeah. of the next thing was? And, and I still was doing that while I was doing stuff with him. Got it. Um, Cause he, I was traveling doing MMA on, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. And then during the weekdays I was doing, um, I was fixing his marketing, um, you know, working on a lot of stuff for him, which I remember one year, I reduced his marketing spend by almost 600 grand. Yeah. And I heard, uh, I heard you tell the story on the, on yeah. the different podcast. I, I okay. want you to tell it again because it's really important. You know, yeah. You know, like uh, I told you sort of before we got on, but the, you know, the, this audience is real is law firm owners, which might as yeah. well be wealth management firm owners, right? Yeah. People that are really usually dialed into what they do from a yeah. technical perspective, but don't really think about the world uh, of business. And if you don't do that, you are putting yourself uh, at a significant, not well, in my, in my uh, profession, you're not really putting yourself at a significant disadvantage. You're just leaving a lot of money on the table because, because everyone sucks, right? For the most part. So, 
Well, Tell so to, to, I was going to say to speak to that, though, some of the best attorneys have the least amount of clients because they only know how to attorney. Yeah. Like the idiots with good commercials and stuff, they got C's in, in law school and they went to a, a bad law school, yeah. but they figured out how to bang a niche out. And like personal injury, those guys are taking lay down cases. It doesn't make them good attorneys. They take yep. easy cases. Yep. And when you have an influx of people saying that they got hurt in car accidents, you can pick and choose which ones you want to take. 100%. And so, so of course you're going to be knock stuff out of the park. You're, yep. You've got, everybody's coming to you. Yeah. But so, um, and that was kind of what spurred me to go into like consulting, but we can get there after I, I tell this one. So um, my dad, and I have like an interesting relationship. We were probably more friends, I think, than than like father son. Yeah. And so uh, I always did things very abstractly. I look at stuff and I kind of disassemble things and figure out how can I disrupt this or or change the process. And he was sending out close to forty thousand invitations for his seminars five page trifold, like third class mail, normal print on the outside of it. And uh, one, a lot of them got sent back. Cause obviously if you're sending to a large mailing list like that, it's a good chance a lot of it's dated. Right. But secondly, he didn't do any dial or dialing in of any of his demographics. It was like, they pick zip codes and they just, they went after it. So yeah. he's paying for dinner for 74, 75 people. There might've been 30 there that, could actually do the investment. Right. Uh, and he had to be careful during his presentation because some of the investments he would talk about, they couldn't be discussed with people that were not accredited. Right. So you, your pitch also has to be skewed yep. because there's no way to prove that all these people had the proper amount of net worth. Like you're not pre-qualifying so, anybody. You just and, 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 show up. Yeah. And we're not asking them for any type of finance documents, like nothing. We're not, yeah. they had, didn't have to prove that they belong in the room. They just yeah. got an invite and they RSVP. So um, one, having a room full of that many people leads to a ton of questions, which deviates you from the whole like purpose of the discussion. But secondly, there's people that would wait for these just to come to eat dinner. Yeah. And, and we, we knew these people first name basis. Like we, and I, you know, I'm there and I'm like, Oh, look, it's, you know, Miss Robinson again for the ninth time. And <laughs> what do you do? Like hire a bouncer and kick him out. So, yeah. um, so I kind of went back to the drawing table and I was like, you're going to need to trust me and kind of let me run with this. And I, <laughs> I remember the first time and I have, I have a, a GED basically from high school. I didn't go to college for anything. I'm not, I didn't have a marketing background. I'm good at logic. And there was a, I was standing at my mailbox. I, and I picked my mail up maybe once a week back when I was 19. <laughs> so, so like I open it and it's now, like, it's way. like this this ball of this mail pile. yeah that's what, I, that's what i get too it's so like i pull it off the top of the thing it falls all over the floor and like i was looking at it and they all look the same yeah every single on they all look the same yep and i was like so if this is my mail how many of these am i opening none and i'm obviously not their target demographic but the fact remains there were people that were targeting me because of right. You're who someone's, I am. You're someone's yeah. target demographic. Yeah. I'm not open to any of it. Yeah. I'm throwing it all away. Yeah. So I went back to the, the office the next day. I was like, can you, can you condense this to one sheet? He was like, what? Because we're talking five pages <laughs> stapled together. And I was like, I go, just main points. Yeah. And and I just wanted one sheet, whatever. It took him a couple of days to shrink it down. I edited it from there. And uh I put it on an eight by 11, just a standard sheet of paper Yep. and uh, went to the list company, um, ended up not using the same list company that they were using before because they the conversation I had with our account guy was not one I liked. So I started shopping. I found somebody to help me out with that. And um, we started laying on demographics. I think I reduced the list to less than 8,000 people. Okay. Um, found a new print company um, that was local to Chicago where we were. And I was like, look, this is what I'm looking to do. I want to do this sheet on a non-folded piece of cardstock. He's like, he's like, and you want to do that in like a standard envelope? I was like, no, let's do it on like a linen envelope. Yeah. Um, I want a linen envelope. I want like a gold foil 
sticker on the back. I want the address as handwritten and I want a first class stamp. Yeah. And the guy was like, like, that's expensive. I'm like, I understand that. Yeah. Um, but the thing about it is if I don't do this, no one's going to read it. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I, I was really surprised that he let me spend it. But this was in 2005. And anybody in wealth management between oh, oh, like 2000 and 2000, you could have thrown darts at a board and you were making money for everybody. Right. So, so he was, this was the time where he was making close to a million a year. And, and back in 2005, a million years was incredible money. Yep. And so I, I think he just kind of just let it go because, you know, why not? Right. And um, the show rate was like 34 to 37 people. They were all qualified. Uh, the conversation that happened in there was very different. Um, the higher rate, his close rate ended up 25 or 30% higher. Yep. And um, the, we just rinsed and repeated different envelope colors, different, you know, whatever. And um, it, it made everything super easy. And then, you know, we had people were asking like, how did you come up with this? Or who's doing the handwriting? Like, I don't know. Like I would just, right. you know, for all I know that it was a font they were using, yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but we went from, we went from 70 something people at dinner to 30 something people at dinner. We weeded out all of the people that were just eating dinner to eat dinner. Now yeah. you're going to have the guys that have had the same quarter of a million dollars for the last 20 years right. with their suitcase and briefcase and notepads and that want to learn everything there is to know before yeah. making an investment. Like those guys still came because they still, still had the money. Qualified at least. I mean, yeah. you got a chance, you know I mean? Yeah. Like, they're, they're still your target market, even though they're yeah. not your ideal sort of sales, you know. No, and, and the the problem with those guys, too, is like then when the market tanks in like 08, those guys are sitting on their couch going, I told you. Yeah. Like, I mean, come on, dude. Like yeah. the market ebbs and flows. For if sure. if you're in it for long game, it's different. If you're in it for short game, it's different. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I mean, that was kind of what started it. And then um, him and I had a... a really large blowout over some decisions that he made. Wait, and like, wait, we didn't talk for two before, years after that. Before we get to that, can we sort yeah. of flesh out a couple of, of like the highlights from that experience so that, so that these people can like take action. I wrote down a couple, I wrote down three things. Yep. Thing number one, because what, because what you talked about is what I, I see all the time as well. Yep. Right. And, and um, you know, I'm, I would consider myself to be like, okay, at business. But yep. number one, you know, reducing the five pages to one. Yep. I think attorneys, wealth managers tend to get be too wordy. They they yep. want to explain the um what I wrote is you want to sell the destination, not the journey. Right. Yep. You want to that one one sheet just needs to tell them what they can <laughs> expect, the highlights, the the top. When well, you level, haven't heard the right? objection yet, so stop trying to overcome all of them. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. The other thing too is, and I talk about this mostly, well, I've done some direct mail before myself, but um, even with Google ads, you know, it's like every, you have to think about every time you're asking somebody to take action, you have yep. to sell that action, right? Yep. Step one, you want them to not just throw your mailer in the trash. Yep. Step two, you, you want them yeah. to open it, right? Yep. Step three, you want them to actually read it. Step four, then you want them to... You got to go through all those things before they'll actually set the, the meeting. With well, you. so do you know how this, this process, so actually we can take this a step further as a business owner. The reason why you don't do that is one, you're trying to provide value, which is completely understandable. Yep. I would understand by, why someone wants to show um, like industry knowledge or expertise, right? The problem is we aren't doing it in a way that's a hook. You're doing right. it in a way that's like a four hour um, what would you call it? Lecture. Yep. We don't need that, you know, but there's a place for the lecture. We right. have to get to it. Yep. So when you're doing this marketing piece and you're talking about, well, you're a customer too, right? That's how yep. all of this is developed. Yeah. If you were going to sell you what you have, what would it take for you to buy it? Well, it would take what I'm trying to give everybody, right? Yep. 100%. Yeah, it's and I think the other thing too is with attorneys, with financial planners, everybody is so you know they want to talk about all the letters that are at the end of their name. They want to talk about all the experience that they have. 
But I'll be honest, when I tell people I'm a lawyer, they sort of automatically think I'm smart. You know yep. what I'm saying? Even if I'm not. Lawyers I mean, and it, doctors, man. Yeah, there's a little bit of street cred that just goes with yep. you being a lawyer, even right. though there's a bunch of numbskulls out there that have no idea what they're doing. If you speak with confidence and say you're a lawyer, like you're you're like 80% of the way. Gospel. Man, yeah. You know? So. Yeah, that, the... Yeah. The biggest thing about being an attorney is you're better off having non-attorneys handle your first points of contact. Yep. And there's a lot of places that are like, I don't want to pay for that. You leave so much money on the table because people are like, oh, they're calling an attorney's office. They want to speak to somebody who, no, they want to talk to someone that see if you can solve their problem. Yeah. The more personable, the more, you know, non-jargon laden conversation they can have the better off it is yeah so um i think i told you through chat like i help scale multiple late law firms yeah and uh um, definitely want to know more about that yeah so i i've done i've been in i don't know 15 different industries the thing people need to understand is business is business and numbers aren't numbers. Yep. the process to to make a sale the pro process to get somebody a product the process to service somebody they're all the same it doesn't matter what industry and, and people love to say, well, this is industry specific. No, it isn't. Nope. And so when I, I'll use one of the larger ones. What, what um, kind of firm, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of practice areas was it? What kind of like, what was the size? Can you give like just a little so bit? So they did, um, we were national by the time I was done. Yeah. Um, they did, uh, they did bankruptcy law, FDCPA, TCPA stuff. It was, okay. it was more uh, consumer law. Yep. That's what it's called, right? Yep. Did they, did um, they advertise? Did they do TV? Like, what did they? What were we the mostly difference? focused on just internet leads? Okay. And um, I can branch off a little bit and talk about how we did or how I did credit repair with a different company, like in this. Yeah. Um, because they're relevant. It's the same. Yeah. Um, so the the first thing that tends to happen, um, and I don't know how many people will see this. They do bankruptcy law, but. When you have someone that's interested in filing a bankruptcy, the first thing that they're doing is basically admitting shame. And so the hardest, I always, we always would get people that would get hired in from debt collector companies that would come in and want to work and they would run the play the same. You know, they're making a phone call on the voicemail or like, we want to talk to you about your debt. No one's going to call you back that wants to file a bankruptcy on that type of a, a voicemail. Yeah. You sound like a debt collector. Yeah. Like they're already dodging everybody. If they filled out all of your stuff on your lead form, it's because they want to talk to someone that wants to solve their problem, not discuss yeah. their problem. Yeah. And so uh, the first thing I did with the system that they had was tell them to start leaving a voicemail that was more specific. You know, hey, you submitted your information on our website. Um, it looks like you're you're trying to get rid of some of your debt. That's something we specialize in. Um, we're, you know, we're free eight to five, you know, if you want to call us back when you're comfortable, you know, we're here to, to kind of talk you through what's going on. Yeah. And, and like, that's it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a word of a number one, but like that's nope. pressure. What, what I tell my attorneys when I, cause I, I have attorneys I, and I teach them to sell. We, we yeah. do a, a tremendous amount of training. Number one thing I tell them is what are we trying to do? They say, and it, it is, what is your problem? Yep. I can help you. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's all people want to hear, you know, like, yep. Oh, you have this thing. It, assuming we can help them with it. What they want to know is we can solve your problem. Right. And not only that, I think at the lower or more entry level spots, people are very price conscious Yeah, because everybody hears how expensive attorneys are. Yep. And so the first question out of their mouth is like, well, that's great, but how much is this going to cost me? Yeah. And now you have to skirt the billable hours because no one understands how the fractions of that kind of stuff works. And so you have to tell them like, look, we need to go through what you're going through to even determine if I'm the right person for yep. you. Yep. You know, I, I'm, I can give you a number and be like, well, our retainer is 1500 bucks. And you, you might tell me I don't have 1500 bucks right now. And that's, that's a conversation that we can have after we find out if I can help you or not. Right. If I can't help you, that conversation doesn't help you or I, you don't know anything about me. I don't know anything about you. Maybe I'm not even a right match. Yeah. Like, so the minute that we finish this conversation, I'm going to tell you straight away what it would take for me to take this on. And you're going to say, this guy is great. I'd love to use him. Or you're going to say, oh, I'm going to go see if there's someone else. And I'm okay with both. Yeah. 
Um, yep. and what, I, what every, I always tell everybody too is by the time we're done with this conversation, you're going to know a lot more about your situation and what you need to do than if you don't have it. You know, like I will tell you what what's up. Yep. Whether you hire me or not, you're at least going to know what the path is yep. that you need to follow, you know? And there's been a lot of attorneys that I've called because I had like a basic question to ask. Yep. And then at the end of the call, I'd be like, I mean, I was like, I'm not trying to pick your brain. Like, I don't, I don't know what this call was worth to you time-wise, but if you want to send me an invoice, I'm happy to pay for it. And 90% of the time, most of them would be like, it's not, you know, it's not a big deal or whatever. But yep. those are the, I send a ton of business to those people. Yep. Everybody's like, oh, I've got a business contract deal. I'm like, call this guy. Right. You know what I mean? Because yep. they're, they're in it for the right reasons. Yeah. And um, the biggest part that I'll tell most people that have law firms is their systems are usually what are broken. Um, they don't handle data correctly. And I don't mean it's not stored properly. They don't work it yeah. the right way. And so uh, this law firm I went into was doing, we'll, we'll say 1.7 a year, maybe okay. yeah. with something like 20 employees. Okay. And um, they, uh, they, brought me in because I had experience in building a two-stage sales process doing credit repair. Okay. And the, the process isn't much different, right? The end goal is the same. The clientele is pretty much the same. And uh, they were using a, a they were using a two-step, but it wasn't very clean. And so uh, like it wasn't a live transfer situation. It was a, they'll call you tomorrow. Yeah. You can't, do that. Like if someone wants to talk about doing something legal, it's usually a now thing. Um, you know, urgency, probate. Urgency. Yeah. Like there's, they, there, there's a problem they're trying to fix. 100%. So if you're like, well, we'll call you, you know, we'll set an appointment for tomorrow. They're still on Google. Yeah. Finding somebody that wants to talk to him today. Yep. So the first thing I did is we went from having like a five, nine dialer that was just kind of serving up everything to a more, a better system that had a, what would you call it? <laughs> had a system that we could set up that would serve things up based on like lead score. Okay. Um, down the road, we ended up building our own system in Salesforce, but there are things out there right now that can, you can program for importance. So like you can say, oh, if a new lead comes in, we want to try and call it three times the first hour. Yep. And it will automatically do that. Then it goes to a break and it'll wait. Um it looks at when it was generated. Like there's a lot of, of checks and balances. And, um, you know, like as a, the dialer. It's like an auto dialer type of a thing? Yeah. Ah, yep. Interesting. And the, the thing about it is too, um, and I don't know how big people are trying to get, but the lead game is really where all of the, the major law firms that are doing nine figures, that's where they generate their business from. Yeah. And it is, a, it is an investment because you are hiring basically a sales team, but this brings you back on, do you own a job or do you own a business? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you go and you look at all the, the major law firms that have five names as partners on them, if you walk into their office, 90% of the time, they're not even there. Right. And they're consulted when they have cases for what they would do in that situation. And they have a bunch of other people that are doing all of the basic work. Yeah. The only way they got to that point was because they were willing to remove themselves from the situation and trust people to do the job they hired them to do. Yep. That's and most people- my firm. Yeah. I stopped doing sales calls in December. So yep. it's been something I've been working towards. It's weird though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, now I'm out of stuff to do. I'm like, I'm, yep. I'm trying to, <laughs> I find myself sometimes like sitting around like, what's next, you know? Yep. But, what's and next? the thing about it too is if you're able to coach people to- say the right things in the right situation and not be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that. Let me ask. Yep. That's fine. And um, the biggest thing that, um, what do you call it? That you have to be concerned about is making sure that they're not doing anything that's like, you know, UPL. If you've got anybody that's not licensed handling any of these phone calls. Right. Um, and so like, I think the hardest part for a lot of people um, when it comes down to like building that team um, is understanding how to coach against that so you don't get trouble. Yeah. Uh, most people in your situation, a lot of people that 
you know, have called us that have been in your position have done this. All that stuff's okay. Yeah. You can't say, well, you've got a case or yeah. your chapter 13 plan payment's going to be this. Like you can't yeah. do that stuff. And so a lot of people freak out that that's going to happen to them and they're going to lose their their license to practice law. And all of that stuff is, you know, very viable. But if you understand how to, if you understand how to coach people up and teach people how to speak, you don't have to worry about that as much. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're right. So some of like we had, I did, um, I do estate planning and probate now. My, okay. So the way I do it though, well, my attorneys sell, that's it. Yep. Only because it's very, you're doing analysis on the phone. Like you're yep. going to tell me what you have and we're going to say you need a trust. You don't need a trust. Like it's hard to really get around that without having to have an extra call. So I'm just like eliminate, you know, we're just going straight to the attorney for the like yep. potential client meeting. But like I did traffic tickets. My my other firm that I did was traffic tickets. That's super simple. I yep. never was on the phone for those because someone says, I got a traffic ticket. We say, we can help you. <laughs> you know, yep. it's whatever, 350 bucks. And they yep. just, we just sign those up all day, you know? And with probate cases too, there's ways to set up systems on the front end that um, make sure that you're capturing information. Yeah. So like there's phone systems where um, you can almost have an AI bot do the intake. So it's like, Hey, you know, thanks for calling such and such. Um, you're, are you calling for uh, real estate planning or is this more probate? Right. You know, people will be like, oh, I'm interested in probate. You know, is this an active, you know, deal? Is there a will? Like whatever. Yep. And it's capturing all that information and it can put it into a thing that will throw it up onto a screen and somebody can literally just like run it all down. Yeah. And there's, it's just like writing a medical protocol, right? If this, then this, if this, yeah. then this, if this, then this, and it turns into a conversation tree Yep. and you can coach anybody a conversation tree. Um, and so you can have anybody be like, oh, well, in most situations, blah, blah, blah. You have a, a situation where there's a house, there's four kids that want it. There's no will. This is what has to happen next. Right. Um, and a lot of the answers are very canned because a lot of the probate problems people run into are the same. For sure. Um, and it's because most people don't do real estate or uh, they don't do estate planning. Right. So <laughs> like, right. that's the other, the other half probate, of it. Yeah. Our probate, when I teach probate, it's very simple do they do they need a probate yep which is pretty uh, you know kind of an up or down thing and are they the one that can be the executor yeah that, those are the those are the two real questions that we need answered on a probate you know potential yep. client call you know that's it it's and it's certain. funny too because the probate calls it's usually somebody that's angry yeah that thinks they have rights to something right oh we get yeah we try to weed those out as best we can yeah so we do very um you know we, we don't do any litigation. So yep. even with our probates, we only take sort of like the vanilla car accident yeah. case. We only do the yep. vanilla probates, you know, because they're very process driven and easy to do. And we just weed those people out at the beginning, you know. Well, and it's kind of like probates, probates not as bad, but like family law is difficult. For it's sure. It's emotional. 100%. You know, th there's a lot of stuff that's involved. You're getting into uh, family heirlooms and, and like there's it's not just cut and dry to the people that are doing it, you know, yeah, Oh, a, a truck rear ended me like, okay. Yeah. You know, Oh, my, my cousin just, uh, where my aunt died, my cousin's trying to take her house. I grew up in that house. Right. Like, I don't want, like, I, I don't, I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's tons of money in family law, but you know, you're getting into custody stuff. You're getting right. it. Family I wouldn't, that would ruin my entire week having did, some of those conversations i did one family law case when i first started practicing law and and then i decided i was never gonna do it again i represented this lady and she was married obviously she had a kids and the the, uh, the dad called me this is a small town i'm from kansas this is a small town in kansas yeah. it was like this these people were not they were like doing meth and there were all kinds of stuff yeah. he calls me and he's like hey he didn't have an attorney he calls me he's like hey you know uh, I want to try to work this out. I don't, um, can we set it up where like on paper, I have 50, 50 custody of the kids. Cause she can have the kids. I don't care. I just don't want to pay don't... child support. Right. And I was like, bro, you know, what's on. wild. That happened to me as a kid. Did it really? Yeah. That's, my dad, um, my dad literally, um, basically paid my mom full child support, even though they had, 
split custody. Oh, really? And then after they agreed to that, she went behind his back and hired a private investigator, I guess, to get full custody. Um, oh, really? So, like, it was a... And, like, depends on who you talk to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I was three. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know if there was a conversation about, you can have the kid if I can have the furniture. I wasn't there for that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but knowing what I went through and having to go to can- counseling like having to hear them argue with each other about who was meaner. Yeah. Like all of that. I still hear it. Yeah. I couldn't imagine doing that as legal practice. Yeah. And reliving that like groundhog day. Agree. Agree. I couldn't do it. No, I couldn't do it. Nope. That's why I got it. That's why I even, so I was doing traffic tickets. I was doing criminal defense, personal injury. And I was like, man, this is this, you know, the money is good, but. It's not that fun. Everybody's coming. No, and you're selling a piece of you with some of it. You know, yeah. I mean, everybody's coming to you in crisis. Even if you get them a good deal, they still have gone through this traumatic event. You know. Yep. That's why I went to estate planning and probate. I was like, well, where's a where's an area where you know people come to you pretty happy, they leave pretty happy. (laughs) Estate planning is definitely that place. You know, because they're 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 trying to protect their family when they're done. They feel relief. You know. Yep. They're happy. They you know they've done something. They 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 have a thing that they know is going to work for them. So. It's weird too, because in legal, everybody glorifies like I always feel like it's defense attorneys. Yeah, you know, you see television shows, and it's always somebody getting somebody off of something. And the flip side of that, like I just got uh, notified of one of my uh, best friends growing up. His brother uh, was really big into drugs, and so he's not all there anymore. Yeah, and uh, a year ago, I think this month, he. He, he was out of jail for a little bit of time, went back to drugs, then attacked a girl he was dating with a hammer. Oh, like hit her 30 times with it, stole a bunch of shit out of her house and like took off down the street. Cops catch up with him, still has the hammer in his hand, wow. has everything that he took. She didn't die or anything like that. He obviously went to jail. Yeah. So he got charged with uh, burglary. He got charged with attempted murder and uh, so- something else. And so they finally went to uh trial or whatever. And um we he we just got it pasted in there. They dropped the attempted murder charge, they dropped the burglaries. So he was supposed to get um concurrent or wait, is it consecutive 17 yeah. year sentences, which would have put him in jail through his 70s. Yeah. With it just being an a, like a willful injury deal, you're looking at a class C felony. That's like 10 years max, and no yeah. one ever gets that. Yeah. So he's already been in jail for a year. Yeah. So what's he going to get out in another year and a half? Maybe. Yeah. And like his family is, is freaking out about it because they've all got restraining orders and stuff against him now. So if he does get out, who do you think he's going after? Right. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, we thought he was going to be in jail. Um, and like, you know, this attorney is getting their high fives and in whatever else, cause they're getting them off. But like, I don't, I understand that everybody needs a defense. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, Yeah. but there's some stuff that people get other people off of that. I don't know that I could, that I could be proud. I did it. Oh yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. When I was doing criminal defense, like I never did any, like anything with kids, no kid related no. cases. I just could never really no no like sex stuff period. Cause it's just like, I, I'm not, I can't do that. You know, and the weird, the weirdest part about that too, is it's a sale in the initial conversation. Cause you know, you want to take work on, they want to have a defense. So they start telling you, you know, stories about what happened, but then you're three months into it and you realize like this guy did it a hundred percent. This guy did it. Yeah. And now you're, you can't, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. You still have to go through with the defense. And then you find this weird loophole that gets him completely off of it. Now you're sitting at home talking to your wife like, yeah, this guy 100% did that, yep. but he's free. It's my fault. Yeah, that's wild, man. It's yeah, it's a it's a crazy, it's a it's a wild profession. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do. Some of them yep. are good, and some of them take a little bit well, more mental. I was gonna say not not to take it off on a huge tangent, but to go back to the a point that that got us here. Yeah. Um, most of the the attorneys and hairdressers and wealth management guys and i mean 
medical doctors. All of these guys are very good at a skill and marketing is not it. Yep. They also don't understand business. They typically don't understand business finance or business money. They're usually control freaks because if you just went through all of the schooling that you have to go through to get all of these types of, of licenses and certificates, you've been in full control of your success and failure. So now you're out and you need a team. Yep. And it's it's really, really hard yeah. for people not to be the bottleneck. And there's so, also, yeah, there's also a lot of ego rolled up in there too. Yeah. And like, I'm so good. No one could do what I do. Yeah. You know? Well, and so, and to be fair, there is a little bit of narcissism that has to, to exist in order for you to believe that you can go out on your own. Yeah. Because if you right. don't believe you're capable of it, you have a problem. Yeah. There's health, there's healthy narcissism. Yeah. And then there's the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, I, um, I, I think, and I, also I mean, I, Go ahead. I was going to say, I think what also happens too with attorneys, with doctors too, like the that attorney title, that doctor title, it becomes such a, a big part of their identity yep. and it's really hard to let that go. You know, like when I started my firm, I didn't want anybody to know I was in charge, you know? Yep. I wanted to be the the boss, right? Yep. I didn't want to, I didn't want to walk around town and be like, oh, there's Chris. He's a great attorney. No, no. I want to have a good I always wanted to have a good law firm, you know, that yep. provided a great service. I, I think it's hard for people to get their head around sometimes, particularly when they've been, it's been a dream to be a doctor, for example, you know, their whole life, like that kind of stuff can be tricky too. So. Yeah. And you get, you get wrapped up in, you know, your, it's your name, right? So people aren't calling, you know, aspire law firm. Oh, yeah, no, my, I'm CMS law firm I yeah. from day one. Forever. And it's, yeah. it's so it's, you know, you hire somebody and they do something weird. It's on you. Yeah. It's not. And so right. that, and that's the, I think the hardest part of, of all of that is to let go of that piece of control. Yeah. Cause who wants to do that? Nobody. Yep. And, and you know what, what, what mistakes will happen. Yeah. Things will not go right. No. <laughs> when you, when you put it, when you bring other people on there, there will be, there will be problems. And the, the biggest thing that I always have to try and remind people too is, you know, you're capable of a hundred percent. So let's say if it's, if it's your law firm and your name is on the door and you're doing all of the work and all of this, and you close a hundred percent, you're doing a hundred percent of business. If you were to hire, um, what is going on with my, I have something that keeps disconnecting and reconnecting and I don't know what it is. Um, if you end up having the, uh, the, the sales team and you've got five people and they're doing consultations and they're talking about this, that, and the third, and they close at 70%. At the end of the day, you're doing 350% of your hundred. Yep. And that's the math that most people aren't willing to go into because it, it's not quantifiable off the jump because they're like, oh, well, I don't want people leaving a review like they didn't get a good consult. You can't, you're going to have your outliers that you can't handle and you can't take. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And if you have people that are able to filter those out so that you're not having every single conversation, because there's, you get the older people that call and they want to make a friend and you're on an hour long mm -hmm. phone call now for free yeah. Because this person just wants to talk to somebody about their situation, which again, I'm not against doing that. I'm not saying that there's no value in that. Like you should help everybody that you can. Yeah. But if you're not the one that answers that call, it's also not your time. So now you have an employee in place that can have that conversation with them to go through the whole, the whole process. Yeah. And so the scalability or your, the ability for you to get your time back is relying on you being able to delegate tasks that you shouldn't be doing to people that can do them. Yeah. And if if you look at your process front to back, it's much longer than you you think it is because you're in it. Yeah. If you sit down and you're like, okay, let me like let me log on the hour every hour what I'm doing during my work day, you're going to find out you're spending way more time on on tasks than you think you are because the the object of time it's not it's whatever's in your head 
Yeah. You know, your time at Universal Studios went really fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, but the time at, at a lecture felt like it was forever. Yeah. And so uh, there's stuff that I like doing and stuff that I don't like doing. And um, to speak personally, um, with one of my business, I've been having conversations with um, private equity recently. And the one thing I'm very good at is self-awareness. And if I could tell people to go and, and read books, there's a book called Positive Intelligence uh, out there that comes with a test on the website. It'll tell you the stuff that you're that you're doing that you're not aware of that are negative. So some people are hyper vigilant. Some people are sticklers. Some people are, um, what would you call it, victims. And there's like nine or ten of these things that people are. And if you can understand how you communicate internally, you can catch it. Yeah. So if I'm a stickler or I'm hyper vigilant, it means that every time something happens to me, I want to strike back. So I can catch myself in my head having this conversation where I want to get, you know, vigilant and I want to go after something. I can be like, whoa, yeah. like I can feel it building. Right. There's a, a book called uh, Thinking in Bets. Yeah. Which talks about. Have you read it? Yep. Um, I think it's a solid book because I think most people, especially that are in uh what do you call it like professional fields yeah they feel like they have to have all of the information in order to make a decision but you're you have the capabilities of adjusting the previous decision once you get to the next one and the only way to warm up or trust your decision making muscle is to use it right because that's how you develop your gut feeling yeah and so um and then the other one is called everything is figure outable um have you before. have you heard of that book too mm -hmm. Yep. The first one so, I had not, the last two I have. So yeah. the positive intelligent book is, is really how my brain works internally. Um, I'm a really firm believer in, in being able to harness internal conversation and turning it because people always say like, I can't do this. If you replace it, you know, with how can I, right. The conversation that you're having with yourself is completely different. One is a statement. The other one is a question. Yeah. And if all of the conversations you have in your head, you spin it towards something that's thought provoking or skill generating or even conversational, it's a lot easier to navigate it. Because if most people walk up to you and said some of the stuff that you say to yourself in your head, you would break their nose. But somehow it's OK for you to talk like that to yourself. And so uh, I and I've spent years like figuring out how to do this, but mm -hmm. I made a post this morning sitting in front of the gym. Um, I'm in kind of like a, a weird rut right now. And like, I've had tech tech stuff break. We're in a slow season for what we do. The weather down here has been bad and I've had to cancel stuff. And so my head's doing this, Yeah. you know, how can I fix it? How do I triage it? There isn't, a, it just is, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing. That doesn't mean that I'm not distracted by it right. because I, I want to, I want to solve, mm -hmm. but I noticed like, okay, I'm not holding myself accountable or accountable to my workouts. What does that mean? I have to go and find something or someone that I have to show up at a certain time. I have to walk in the door. It's got to start. Someone's going to tell me what to do. And eventually I'll come back out of the backside of it. Like nothing happened. Yeah. But the thing is, if I don't do that, I'm going to have all this extra time to start stressing about all the stuff that I can't do anything about, because if I could, I would have already done it. And so I'm, I'm sitting here worried about things I can't control. Yeah. Like, oh, the weather. If I refresh the, the radar on it, maybe the snow's going to go away. It's not. Yeah. And so um, if you've got a, a small law firm or a small business, and you're trying to get to a point where you're bigger or you can remove yourself from it, or you could take vacations, or you could work from wherever you want to wherever you want to stand, you're going to have to understand that part of that comes from your internal conversations about letting things go and understanding that that you can't do everything. And, and if you can't hear it in your head when you hire somebody, the first thing you're going to do is be like, I'm going to hire someone to answer the phones. But because you answer the phones the entire time, you, you're going to you're going to pick the phone up. Right. And they'll, they're going to be like, well, why is he picking up the phone? They're not going to be like, please don't pick up the phone because you pay their pay check. Right. So if you want to pick the phone up, you can do whatever you want. Like you're, yeah. it's it's you. Yeah. But you shouldn't be. No. And, and no. you know, you know that you're not supposed to, Yeah, but you do it anyway. Yep. Here's the other thing too. When that happens, when you do get that first person, they probably are going to suck because you yep. don't know what you're doing. And just because no. you hire one person that sucks does not mean that everyone sucks. No. You know? I've had that many times. 
So I had this conversation with somebody recently because it's very important to understand their stages to hiring. One, when you're new to market and hiring people, your pay is going to probably be lower than most people that have a lot of experience because you don't want to hemorrhage money everywhere. Yep. But two, you don't have a footprint locally. No one knows you. No one's heard of you. No one's. No one knows if you're going to be open in two weeks. The resumes that you're going to get for those people are going to be people that typically don't keep jobs very long, that do a lot of jumping around, that maybe have some home life problems. Maybe they like to drink. I don't know. But those are the people you're going to interview first. And those are the people you're going to hire first because no one's going to take, no one that's that's worth triple what they're worth is going to take a chance on you because you have a story. And so you're going to hire that person. You're going to have to pour a lot into him, but you also have to be quick to fire. And that's where I think people fail. Yeah. Hiring is not a skill. And people argue with me all the time, like, oh, but it is, but it's not. You're selling a job. They're selling themselves. You don't have, there's no information that you can go and gather. No one's going to give you a reference that's going to talk shit about them, right? right? You're not going to call every single business that they worked uh, for and verify if those were the years that they were there. And this was the reason why they left. So you have all these gaps and all these things that are going to be happening and you're going to have to trust your bullshit meter. But like the minute you get them into the role after, after three weeks, you're going to know whether they're a culture fit or not. You know, and the thing is, they'll be like, oh, well, they're a nice person. They have kids. They have a family. This is your business. You can care about what happens to them, but you have to care about your business because it pays you both. And if you're not ripping the bandaid off and you're not getting rid of people because you think you can save them or whatever, it's going to cost you a lot more than just their paycheck. Yeah. And and people, people want to believe that other people want things for themselves that you want for them. And if they don't want it, you can't force it on them. You know, my, like to go back to the situation, my dad, he hired this woman and her very first day, she showed up 13 minutes late, put her coat on the back of her chair and was like, I'm going to go to McDonald's to get coffee. I'm 22. I'm sitting in my chair and I'm like, what just happened? Yeah. And she walked out to go to McDonald's. Right. I had never met this woman. And like, I'm the one that runs the whole office. Yeah. And she didn't ask me. Right. She told me. Right. And then she did it. And I'm, I'm like sitting there in my chair. And like the fight that we had was, I was like, you need to fire her or I'm leaving. That, I mean, that was, we had that argument in July of 2005. Yeah. And, and he was like, she has more talent in her little pinky than you do. And, and all this experience stuff. I changed my phone number. I moved. Like, and I went and got a, another job, Yeah. but three months later, he's ringing the desk at my new job, asking me where money went. And I found like 83 grand that she embe or embezzled. That's crazy. But like, my gut was like, this person sucks. Yeah. And, and I, within two weeks, I'm like, I mean, I want to fire her. Like right. your gut and the facts. Yeah. Honestly, they were both. And that's, yeah. She would kept asking for access to QuickBooks. I mean, it was wild, but yeah. the thing is like, I've been. I've been, I'll say I've been decent about that yeah. because there have been times where I have kept people six months past the expiration date because yeah. I, I really thought that they had it in them and I'll have my employees will be cussing me out being like, you're getting taken advantage of and it, they're right, yeah. you know, and I apologize to them when they're right. I also don't tell them to stay in their lane when they're telling me that yeah. because you have to have people that feel comfortable checking you. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, you know, your wife or your spouse is always, you know, good for that. But there's a, I can't remember what the complex is called. Um, but like, you don't want to take advice from your spouse or your friend. Like, but if a stranger tells you verbatim the same <laughs> right. thing that they did, yes. you're like, that's the best that's idea I've ever out. heard. It's like getting coached to anything. Yeah. Spouse told um, you some milk. No. And so I would, like I said, I would just tell people that are listening, you know, interview people and hire people. But the minute that they're not fits, don't be afraid to move on. Yep. And number two, if you do hire people that are, we'll just call it not blue chippers. When you get to the new phase of your business, you're able to pay more and you're hiring different. They either need to meet the level of, of production 
that the the new people are or you need to fire them because you cannot you can't um what do you call it you have to fire loyalty in that point because they're not good for the business just because they've been with you ride or die for a long time doesn't mean they're ready for phase two and if they didn't work on their personal growth enough and they didn't see it coming it's not your fault yeah and and especially small firms, small wealth management firms, small law firms that are very family-like, they get stuck in the, the ability to move to stage two because they keep everyone from stage one. Right. And um, I don't know if you saw Ryan's big post um, that he made talking about why he made some of the staff decisions. Yeah. I got into a very aggressive conversation with a group of people after that post came out because they were all slamming him for it. And I was like, I was like guys, you sound like Mr. Rogers. I want everyone to have good lives. I want everyone to enjoy what they do at work. I want everyone to feel appreciated. Yeah. But not the, the same car that got you to the racetrack can't can't run the race. Right. And you have to go and get in another car. Yep. Yeah. And so there's going to be people that didn't put the work in that have to stay at at the train station. And um, you know, he was talking about um, a COO that does this and a COO that does that. You know. In certain circumstances, a COO is almost a executive assistant, right? Uh, for some for some business sizes, because that's the operating pieces that they're working on. Once all of the that stuff is in order, and you need someone to actually take on operations, a whole different skill set. Yeah. And so, like, I don't have any problems with the people that he let go or anything like that, yeah. but I do understand and can explain the reason why he would make those decisions. Yeah. You know, does it make it suck? Less? No. No, it doesn't. And, 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 you know, the other thing to remember, too, is it's not like they, there's no other opportunities out there for no. those people either. You know, they have gained skills and, and you know, are more experienced and can do the next thing that's in their sort of career path. But you're 100% yep. right. It, you, there, there becomes a level as you begin to scale up where no matter how hard you try, you you – haven't done the thing before that now needs to be done. Right. I mean, there's just no getting around that. Well, and, and everybody always asked me, like, if I had so much fun taking other people to market or taking other people public or whatever, why did I go out on my own? I watched all of them destroy the businesses. Yeah. So like all the culture I, that I would bring in, all of the process I would bring in all the, the minute that we started doing something, they would reintroduce something that didn't need to be there whether it was ego, whether it was greed, whether whatever it was, they would reintroduce it to the batter and it destroys the cake. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was a, a situation where I had a, there's a smaller law firm that I was working for here in Texas. They went from doing 700 grand a year to 3.4 million a year in less than a year and a half, just by introducing the systems that I had in place. Yeah. There was a, a relative that was part of the business that decided that he wanted to get into doing personal injury leads, and he chose California first. If anybody knows anything about leads and personal injury leads, California is the most expensive state right. to do that in. Right. It's the most competitive state. It's the most expensive, like, but that was the one he chose. Well, but in a, a bankruptcy model like the one I build, you're putting people on payment plans in some situations that's 10 bucks a month. Because the goal is to have them in the system yep. and piff them out when they when they file their tax return. They And then we started over, right? Yep. And so it was October, they came and they were like, well, we're spending more on leads than we're bringing in in revenue. I'm like, that's that's literally the business model. Yes. Like, Especially that's how this is done. It, there's, a, there's, a, there's a time from when you sign up to when you cash out anyway yeah. with the PI case. Yeah, and, and like, and the wild thing was, is they were like, well, make this make sense. They're like, well, we aren't doing a lot of in San Antonio or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it ebbs and it flows. Yeah, You know, we will take on a lot of new cases in the summer of people that can't file or can't afford it until tax time. But the thing is, we're bringing on five or six new clients a day. So if we're at 30 new clients a day, we're at 120 new clients a month. That's that's 1500 clients a year Yeah, at three grand a pop. Right. Like, what are you what are you mad about? And um, it, there's obviously on top of that, you have your chapter 13s, you have all your residual payments, you have whatever, but it's they, I ended up literally packing up my entire office in the back of my truck after the fourth time they came down and accused me of bleeding money everywhere. Um, 
after a year after I left that law firm, they were back below 700 grand. They had fired more than half their staff oh, and they had moved two people down to part time. And it's like, I understand that you want to like, you want to empower people, especially in your family to do things in your business because it's, it helps everybody, but you can't go after the people that are making shit happen and side with family. Right. Because I didn't, I don't get anything out of making anything up. Yep. I got paid on performance. Yep. So on the months where stuff's down, I'm down too. You don't see me like scrambling. Like I was in there, you know, taking care of data and watching Twitch streamers. Like that was how relaxed I was about it. <laughs> right. Because we're hiring the number of people we're supposed to be hiring. Yeah. And yeah. then in January, the emails and texts go out like, hey, after you, you've got your tax return, hit us and let's get you filed. Right. Um, and it was, it was just really, it was really difficult to watch because if that law firm would have understood that we were in phase two and they would have got rid of all of the people that taxed the business, they could have gone from, you know, 3.5 to 7 million and we could have moved into operating in other States. Um, yeah. but people, they try to hold people too close. And a lot of times there's nepotism. People get repurposed and put in positions they don't have the skills for, uh, because they are loyal. And we need to keep them around. You're harming them by not letting them go. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I, I'm explaining that, okay. You are definitely explaining it. Okay. And this is the, we got to wrap up here pretty soon, but this is one of the things that I definitely wanted to talk to you about. And you, yeah. have, you have segued into it perfectly. <laughs> this is, this is the, uh, you let advice. me ramble enough. I'll get there. No, this is the, <laughs> just the free advice uh, section of the podcast. You know, it's like, one of the things that I, I was curious about from your perspective, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, is, you know, I am trying to grow my business, and I, the, so real quick background the way I'm kind of the way I'm kind of structuring my business is I want tiny teams, um, in different locations that just crush, right? Yep. The systems That's are in why. place; they will win. The systems will work wherever I drop the next office, right? the where i'm where i'm unsure i guess is like how fast it to grow without growing too too fast i don't know if that makes sense like i'm um like right now i basically have two offices almost full now i'm trying to figure out when when should i go to office number three we should yep. that, does that make sense yeah what what what, what Tell me, like, whatever I just said, what what are your thoughts on that? Like, so the one thing I, that I'll tell people, and this is this is almost where I start every conversation when I go into to, to talk to somebody, is I have to be sure before I even choose to work with you that you understand we're not selling or we're not scaling sales without applicable service, right? Because most businesses go in and they try and generate revenue first. You can only go to market one time. And the type of stuff that you're doing, you're local. So if you go to market and you take on a bunch of business that you can't service, everyone's going to talk about it. Right. And you will never recover from that. But they want the money because without the money, we can't pay for this new office, right? So let's hit the ground running. Let's take on as much business as possible. Let's generate as much revenue as we can. And, you know, we'll figure it out. And that's what most people do. And if you go and you look at uh, like gyms, for example, you'll get a crunch that will want to open up where you're at. They'll they'll start selling in August. They'll tell everyone it's going to open in October. They push opening all the way to March. Go look at their Google reviews. Right. They lied to me. I've been a member since this. Like, do you do you want that? Of course you don't. Right. So when you put a system together and you go to launch something, the three things you have to ask yourself are, is everything I'm doing measurable? Is everything I'm doing repeatable? And everything I'm doing scalable. Because if if they are those things, you can measure all the tasks that you have in place. There isn't anything that you, you don't know how to pull a number or a piece of data from. The number two is repeating everything. If everything I have can be copied and pasted, then there is no bottleneck. And can I scale it? So I have all of these numbers. I have all of the tasks that I can replicate. And I know that there is no end to how many times we can replicate these tasks. Yeah. If you have all of that stuff, you can grow as fast as you want because you know exactly what you need at each stage of growth to continue success. 
Yeah. So in your case, like, so for me on my medical stuff, we're looking at copy and pasting into other states. There's different things that change because I'm not physically there. There's a logistics piece that I take care of on some things where I'm actually driving to warehouses and doing those things. Yeah. We have to fix that because I can't do that in Florida. Yeah. Um, the marketing and stuff like that, that I handle personally. I have to come up with SOPs so people understand the way that I do marketing. But I have to completely remove myself from the entire equation. Because I I can't, if I get to 3,000 of these things running at a time, I'm not, I'm chairman of the board now. Right, right. I'm sure. not, no one's calling me for anything. Right. You know, I'm sending emails out going, hey, I think we should do this. Um, and that's what everybody wants to get to. Yeah. But the, the problem is they try and meddle in everything that's going on. If you go into a market and you you break into it and you say you put an office there and you sign a three year lease, maybe that market's not good. Yeah. You know, but do you do you sign a new three year lease and try to gut it out or do you pick the team up and move it? Right. Most people would stay. Yeah. Like, oh, these people aren't going to move with me. Like, there's no market here. Right. We've got three years of data. We we spent on the marketing. We spent on all this stuff. We hired the staff. We turned the staff. What else can we do? I've got nine other examples that this is perfect. But this market's just not for me. Yeah. But most people won't be like, oh, well, we're just going to shutter this one. I walked away from five brick and mortar businesses during COVID. They were they were lease renewal deals, uh, years. And they wanted to raise rent on me. And they wanted me to sign a minimum of three years. I didn't even know if I could open my, when I could open my right. businesses again. Right. And people are like, you literally walked away. You didn't even sell them. I'm like, who am I going to sell a business I can't <laughs> open to? Who's right. going to buy it? Right. And I mean, that's millions of dollars yeah. that I just, I walked away from. Yeah. But it's, I don't think about it like that because it freed up my time to do a bunch of the other stuff that I was able to do. Yeah. And it's, you know, oh, well, think about if you would have kept them. I would have nowhere near what I have today right. because those things were very time intensive. And I didn't realize it until I sat down and thought, is it, is it worth it? And at that point, you can't look at how much money you've invested, how much time you've been there. How, how well you know the people that are working for you. Because none of that stuff matters. Yeah. So if your goal is you want to have an office in major metro areas that have um, average uh, home or household incomes that are north of half a million dollars, there aren't a lot of those. Right. But you're going to have to figure out which ones are saturated by probate attorneys. Like, And that's just research that you're doing. Yeah. But if you know that your systems are in place, all the stuff that you do works, you don't need to be there. You, you train up your next guy yeah, and drop it and run. Yeah. I think for me, it's just a little bit of internal anxiety, you know, about doing stuff I haven't done before. There's, I think there's definitely some of that. So there's an analogy I always use for that. And most people laugh, but do you remember when like the pool opened in the summer? Yeah. yeah. So when you were five, you fearlessly ran at the pool and just jumped in it. Yeah. You didn't give a shit about the temperature. None of that mattered. Right. When you were 13, you walked around the pool a little bit. The pool hasn't changed. Yeah. It's the same pool. Yeah. It's the same pool you've run and you've jumped in a hundred times for the last nine years. All of the sudden, well, what if it's cold? Right. It's never stopped you before. So all you're doing now by dipping your toe in and doing all this stuff, you're wasting sunlight and swim time. You know that you're capable of swimming. You know that you're going to get used to the water. Why would you? You already paid. Yeah. Why would you just get in? Yeah. Because if there is a problem with the water, you can get back out. Right. But what's the what's the point of standing on the deck staring at it? Yeah. You know? Good point. Yes. You make good points. You make good I, points. It's just, and that's where the emotion makes us do bad or make bad decisions. Yeah. You know, and fear is a, a big, big one. And that's the only reason I'm not afraid of anything. Um, and I can, I'll tell you that like absolutely factually, there are certain foods I won't try. Um, but, but it's, so we'll say, we'll say with, with a certain amount of due diligence, there's, there's nothing I'm afraid of. Yeah. And um, I don't, I'm going to figure it out. And that's the only thing I'm sure. Of. For sure. Yep. I think there's some element though, you know, to go back to this idea of, you know, what got you here won't get you there. I, I think there's also a level of personal growth that yeah. you have to go through, you know, to, to just, um, to make, to make what's new normal, essentially, yeah. you know, like what I do now 
before I was, I was totally afraid to do, but now yeah. it's like no big deal. Cause I've done, cause you know, I'm, I'm here. I just got to push myself. I think to just get to do the same thing again and then again and again, you're just constantly doing that. I think. Well, it's the, it's the power of what if, right. Um, what if you never took the, like, what if you didn't go to law school? Cause you thought it was too daunting. Yeah. Cause there was a point in time you're sitting there and you're like, God, do I really want to do that? Right. And then you're like, you know what? Yeah. Like we're going to go through that. And then you got out and you're like, you know what we're going to do? Let's do defense law. No, nah, that's not for me. Yeah. I mean, it's just a bunch of pivoting. Yeah. And you're not, you don't necessarily change the way you operate. You understand how to become more efficient. And efficiency comes from one, enjoying what you're doing. Right. But two, being fulfilled in the activities themselves. There's plenty of people I meet that make way more money than I do. And I do not want their life. I wouldn't trade it. I do not care. I'm not interested. Um, you know, they're bringing home 10, $12 million a year. They're overweight. They're stressed out. They can't yep. sleep. Their home life sucks. I don't care enough. Like how much is enough for you? Right. You know, right. I want to be able to do what I want to do when I feel like I want to do it. Yep. That's it. Yep. I, agree. I don't need to have 74 houses. I don't need 12,000 square feet because I'm not paying someone to dust it. Yep. I don't care about that stuff. Yep. But there's a lot of people who are very much defined by their level of success, not even monetarily, just profession. I like doing business because it's fun. Yep. It just so happens that my hobby, whether I'm good at it or not, is measured in in money. Yeah. If if I like painting, it would be how, you know, how great can I do shading and, and color transitions? And that's how people would judge me. And I'm okay with that. Yep. You know, yep. I, there's plenty of people I know that are artists. That's yeah. just not my art. Um, and and you've and you followed me on Facebook long enough to know, I don't post about what I have. I don't post right. about how much money I make. I don't put. Sure. I don't post about any of it. Right. I barely post vacation photos. Like, um, because I'm not your, out. The only thing I see are your cars in the gym parking lot with Teslas <laughs> right next to them in the back. <laughs> so so funny. Do you know how that all started? No. Man, so 2017, I used to go to this Lifetime Fitness uh, that was new over in like Alliance Town Center, which is like North Fort Worth, like Keller okay. area. Yeah. And I was parked like far away. I always have. And I backed into a spot. There was this Porsche Boxster that used to park a row in front of me and would take up two, three, four parking spots. Mm -hmm. And so I would take a picture of it. And I'm like, who, dri like, who drives this car? And I'll be like, oh, like we're barely in two spots today. So we're getting better. And then like, I would come back the next day and they would be like horizontal on four spots. <laughs> right. So people literally started following me just to see like what this person did. And I didn't know that people were so in, like invested in it. Yeah. And so <laughs> I remember posting up, I actually went to my car to leave the gym a half hour earlier than I normally did. And the person who drives the car actually was walking out to their car. And so I took a picture of them getting into it. And I was like, of course it's a woman. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and it turned into like a big joke. And so um, I think during COVID, obviously that all fell off. So I started taking pictures of, like I would park crooked. And, I, and I'd be like, and I owned a gym at the time. So I was going to my own gym okay. to work out. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm posted in, you know, four different parking spots in front of my gym. And I'd be like, in case you missed it, you know, here's me parked like an idiot. And, um, and that was literally how it all started. Yeah. And so like, as I got nicer cars, like, you know, people would start parking next to me or whatever. And that's literally what it, it all came out of. So I was just being sarcastic about stuff and now it's, it's, yeah, uh, it's like that. Yeah. But yeah, I just don't, I'm not about my stuff. Like stuff yeah. is cool. Um, like I have a, a black V neck on, I'm wearing like basketball shorts from 2009 yeah. and some slides like under it. I look homeless about 90% of the time um, just because that's not why I do it. Yeah. You know, I like to go on vacation with my life. Um, eventually I'd like to sell my businesses and and I want both of us to see the world. Yeah. Um, there's so much to experience and there's so many things to do that I'm terrified of missing it. And so I'm doing all of the things that I have to do and learning all the lessons that I have to do now and giving up the control that I have to give up now in order to make all that stuff happen in a manner that 
takes takes us where we're going. Yeah. And would it be nice to have all the control in the world and and feel like I'm the one moving the needle all the time? I mean, sure. But the business that I've created, they aren't for me. You know, they're I'm creating opportunities for the staff I have to get married and buy houses and go on vacations. The yeah. patients that we're treating or the the Amazon people who are buying our stuff to have access to things that they wouldn't normally do and do it at prices that they can afford and, and whatever. I'm never the most expensive anything. I don't do, I don't push prices up. I don't run premiums. I don't push margins. I push volume. Yep. And, um, and, and I, I truly believe that you get out of the universe, what you put into it. And so if, if your ambition is honest and you're taking people with you, on your way, you can't fail. Because it like I'm not important in my business. No, none of none of the people that buy anything that I'm associated with know I'm alive. Why would I run around acting like I'm the key to everything that's happening? I'm not. Without happy employees, none of the customers enjoy what's happening. So if if you're not if you're not taking that position seriously from a leadership standpoint, you can't grow. Yeah. Because no one's going to want to go along with you on the ride. People want to be trusted, people want to be asked their opinion. People want to go home and feel like they're they're fulfilled in what they're doing. You know, and if you're providing those types of things, you will never have a staffing problem. And and if you go into a hiring thing and it's about you and you want your free time and it's your business and it's your ideas and it's your this and it's your that, people are going to run. Yeah. And and I'm sure you've found that out because I think we all do that initially Um, because it's our baby, right? It's our business. It's our money. It's our income. It's our our whatever. And, And somebody that does something that puts your brand at risk, your your initial reaction is to get defensive. We can't do that. That's not how we do business. You know better than that. But if I don't empower people to make mistakes, they're never going to make decisions. Yeah. And if they can't make decisions, how do I move on? But no, right. no one does that. Nope, nope. And that, by the way, is a perfect spot to end, I think. that Because that cool. sums up the whole thing. And, and um, you know, just, I guess, in closing, I, I really want to just thank you for your time. You know, I'm grateful you came on and and um chatted with me i i I don't do these very often because honestly there's not a lot of people that i want to talk to yeah yeah. you know i don't want somebody just selling something or pushing yeah i have a product yeah or whatever i just like to have i like to talk about this stuff with people that know what they're talking about so yeah really do appreciate these are my favorite types of of conversations to have most of the podcasts i go on they're like all right we're doing 45 minutes. I got three questions. We run for an hour and a half because yeah. I don't, I mean, if you, if we get going on a topic um, and it's something that I'm passionate about, like I just, I literally go down a black hole. Like, and I don't know how to yeah, stop well, it. Look, I mean, there's so much to learn and there, there, you know, everybody's perspective is, is helpful and you have a ton of experience with this stuff and, and it's interesting, right? I mean, I, I, I love business. Like I yep. I, I'm, I think I'm very much like you. Like I, I love doing this, you know, it is fun for me. It is something that is interesting to me and, and I, I really enjoy it. You know, I don't, I don't like taking vacations is fun, but I don't, um, I don't need the vacation. You know, I don't yep. need the change. It's more just for the experience or just to, yep. you know, off to, honestly, it's mostly for my fiance that yep. wants to go and we'll just, just spend some time together or whatever. But, um, yep. so yeah. So anyway, I really, really do appreciate it. And, uh, you know, Maybe I'll try to have you on again sometime in the future. Plenty, plenty. Yeah, I'm always around, man. Talk about. So uh, uh, that's it, man. Thank you so cool. much for your time, man. Appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, we'll do it again. All right, definitely. All right, see you. See you. Bye.